Well, anyway, so uh, I'd like to first thank Gary. It's uh, sort of interesting being a banker that I have to follow an attorney. He's actually very funny, so um, I, I thought that was nice. Um, so I, I think it's a really, and I guess I'm trying to sort of survey the audience and figure out sort of what kind of animals we have here, but um, I've been in the tech banking business for 20 years, and so I lived through the gaga period of the IPOs um, <clears throat> at a firm called Montgomery Securities. And we were one of the four horsemen that came, and, and I've been to Israel, uh, gosh, I'd guess about 15, 20 times. Um, so as I've been here for three days now and had a chance to meet with a lot of venture capitalists and entrepreneurs, um, I think it's a really interesting time for Israel because what's happened is that since the downturn happened, a lot of money was raised in 2000, or money was put to work in 2001, 2002, 2003. And as the gestation period has occurred, there's actually a bunch of companies that are getting to that point where they're getting to critical mass um, <clears throat> and there's going to be exits uh, or liquidity events. And so it's going to be really interesting. I think that's going to happen in 2011, 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014. And it's going to be a lot more than it's been historically here over the last uh, nine years or so. So I think it's very interesting. Um, obviously, when you get into the topic of IPOs and what to do, there's a whole bunch of thoughts that come to mind. Um, the one other consideration I would put on, uh, you know, what was just said about going public is uh, oftentimes there's outside backers in your company. And so I think there's somewhat of a, there, you, you obligate yourself to, to achieve a liquidity event. And oftentimes that decision is m made by the shareholders. So um, anyway, so for... Um, my talk, I'm just going to kind of uh, go through a little bit about sort of where we are in the capital markets. I again, personally, I think this is a fascinating time. Uh, it was a lot more fun in 1999 and in the mid-90s when we were, you just sort of showed up and everything grew 30% and we took a lot of companies public and making money was easy. It doesn't matter what business you're in today, making money is going to be hard work. But I do think that uh, I think we've, there's, the recipe has been lost to help growth companies. And I do think that the IPO market is a very important tool uh, for growth companies because without it, and we, we didn't have this for a while, um, without it, you can't sell your business for a high price because when you go to, when Oracle and IBM and all these companies said, look, I'm the logical buyer for all your companies, and if there's not an IPO, there's not a competing alternative, they're just going to draw a line and say, $200 million, we're not going to pay you a penny more. And it, it takes away your leverage. So I, I think it's important. It, obviously, uh, being a Silicon Valley guy, it's created a lot of wealth. And, and I do think the other fascinating thing, which is going on around us today, which is there's a whole new wave of technology that's going to be occurring. Now, there's always various pockets, but the biggest driver of that is everybody's got an iPhone and everybody's got an iPad and everybody's streaming video. And what does that mean for the networks and all the technology that's going to be needed to support that? And so I, I, I personally think and our firm thinks that there's going to be a whole new wave of uh, exciting companies and technologies and a lot of interesting growth. Um, so in the category of um, it used to be a lot more fun in the 90s, um, you could take concept companies public, um, but today uh, there's more discipline in the market, and, and maybe that's not such a bad thing either. So just to give you sort of a barometer of what's, what's changed, which is we used to do in the mid, from 1990 to 2000, uh, we took a lot more companies public on average. Uh, you know, in a good year we had 200 plus. Today it's about 20. Um, the size to go public... Uh, we used to do, and, and again, there's a question, and maybe it'll come out in the panel, which is, is it viable to do a $50 million IPO with a $200 million market capitalization if it's a good company? Um, my own bias is yes. Um, so we used to, all, all the time, in the early stage of the IPO market, and for many companies, uh, we used to take them public at much smaller amounts with much smaller valuations, and many of those became very big winners. Um, Revenues used to have to be about $40 million. You didn't have to be profitable. And it took about five to eight years from investment to get a company public. Um, today, 
conventional wisdom, and, and I would challenge some of this, says you have to be about 80 to $100 million on a run rate basis. That's you know, your last quarter multiplied by four. Um, an IPO needs to ensure sufficient liquidity for the institution, so conventional wisdom, again, says that needs to be $75 million plus. Uh, investors like to see companies that are profitable, but oftentimes it sort of depends because there are many cases, I, I think, where uh, if a company has a rapid growth trajectory or it can invest in a new product and that comes to the detriment of profitability, I think smart investors understand that, and it takes longer. So the challenge we have is it takes longer to get companies to that point where they could go public, and it also takes more money. So just to give you, you know, what the facts are, this looks at the tech IPO since 1990. Um, you can see that uh, on average uh, it was about 70-odd IPOs a year in the mid-90s. Uh, today it's about 30, so it's quite a considerable, uh, quite a considerable drop. Um, but I think that there is also the big challenge that we have in Silicon Valley is the big tech companies don't grow. And if you're a tech investor, you're a growth investor, not a value investor. And so I think that emerging mature companies that can participate in some of these new interesting drivers should be very interesting to institutional investors. Um, again, we tend to... Most companies that I assume here in this audience have outside capital, whether that's from angels, which is a very viable thing here, or from venture capitalists. So we look at the um, venture back exits. Uh, while we talk about IPOs, historically M&A has always dwarfed um, the IPO, uh, IPOs for um, private venture back companies. I would point out, um, when you look at 99 to 2000, Again, you had a healthy number of IPOs, and a lot of the a lot of the big wealth that was created was created from going public. It, it, yes, there were some exceptions in '99 and 2000 where companies sold, were sold for in the billions of dollars, and there's still a few of those today. But by and large, how the big wealth was created was by going public and, and building it in the aftermarket. One thing I just want to say is. As you think about going public, it's really not an end, it's a new beginning. And so going public's a start and it's sort of a new life, but in baseball uh, terminology, it's like the first inning of a nine-inning game. You don't really get rich at the IPO, you get wealth on paper, but to make that worth something, you have to get through a 180-day lockup and you have to build value. And so great companies were able to go public and execute as public companies and create a lot of wealth. Um, Today, as you see, uh, the math in terms of the um, number of M&A transactions, it's, it's similar. I mean, it's similar to where it was in 99 and 2000, uh, but it's just, it pales in comparison to the number of IPOs. And again, the challenge is, and we've been through these periods, where in 08 and 09, when you really didn't have a viable IPO market, the big buyers just said, we're drawing the line, and this is, you know, we're not going to pay any more for any of these companies. And they... So we do need that tension in the IPO market to help uh, value realization for uh, private companies. Um, so then uh, this chart looks at uh, this chart looks at it on a, on a dollars basis. So um, again, the average amount raised from an IPO. I looked at 2001 to 2010 is about 2.6 billion in aggregate. The average size of an IPO from 01 to 010 is 60 million dollars. Um, you know, the M&A deal sizes are, uh, on average, uh, 75 million. There were obviously uh, greater numbers here. And the one thing I just want to point out is size of IPO amount raised. The more interesting statistic is probably wealth created. So it's like when you took the company public and how much wealth was created. And again, when you look at the returns of venture capital companies, they made big money by getting companies public and having them succeed as public companies. Uh, not so much from uh, selling companies. And um, anyway, so these are the statistics there. So the question is, why aren't there more IPOs? There's a, a variety of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is, and this is okay because most IPOs are sold to institutional investors, that most haven't worked out. Most IPOs uh, have not performed, so that's one of the reasons for that. But I think the reason why institutional investors like to invest in IPOs because they think that one of these could be that next big thing and it could yield 10x returns and it could be a very big company. So there's still interest in that, but um, 
I think the other challenge is, like so many businesses where there's been consolidation, financial service is no exception, that the funds have gotten a lot bigger. So the uh, willingness of, if you're a, managing a $20 billion fund at Fidelity and a $60 million IPO comes up and you can only own 5% of that, it really isn't any, even if it doubles or triples, it doesn't move the needle. Uh, the market has also changed. There's more program trading. There's hedge funds versus fundamental investors. And, and the other thing that, and again, I would submit to you that I think we collectively, being the venture capitalists and, and the companies and the investment banks to a certain extent, have lost the recipe. Taking companies public is an art. It's not a cookie cutter thing. You don't just, you, you don't just lay it all out there and let the investors figure it out. It, it's a lot of work, and that's what we used to do. But I think people, we've lost our way, and, and, and uh, it, hopefully we can find our way again. Um, also, uh, as was touched on, the cost of going public has gone way up. It costs a lot more. The, uh, you're going to invest about $3 million to go public, and there's a chance you don't. And then you have ongoing costs and so on. And the perceived benefit, it isn't, it isn't what it used to. As you know, was mentioned about you, you might go to jail if you have wrong statements. So there's a perception in the risk-reward trade-off that it's not quite as great to be a public company. And the other challenge, uh, and again, I, I want you to understand, I, I have a, a horse in this race, which I'm a I have a bias that I think there is a big opportunity to take more companies public, is there are less uh, home run potential IPO candidates. Now, just to digress for a second, and when we mean home run IPO candidates, we're talking about Google's, Facebook's, Checkpoint's, those kind of companies. But when you look at your, the, the, um, the makeup of IPOs in years past is what people forget, is that in pyramid theory, there are only a handful of A's. Most of the companies are B's. They're B pluses, B's, or B minuses. A few we think are B's actually turn out to be C's. But all those companies have a place in the marketplace. So there's no reason today when we look at the tech IPO market, which has not, uh, has not performed well at all this year, that there isn't room for those companies. The problem is, is the investors really aren't sure why they should own them, and these companies are not being, having their stories told correctly. So <laughs> what, what, sh what should you do as an emerging private company? I think one thing is we've seen, and this is from a U.S. perspective, I think Israel being no different, is that the amount of capital that used to go to fund these companies has shrunk dramatically. In the U.S., it's down about 50%, it's down about 50 and, and I think rightfully so. And sadly, I think uh, there were strategies precipitated by the people that raised a lot of capital that said, I've got all this capital, I needed to put it to work, so I want you to spend money big. And what we've learned in the aftermath of that is that many times that, was, that money wasn't well spent. It was spent too aggressively. So I, I think you want to be very careful in how you fund a business and how you raise capital. Because if we go back, prior to the existence of the venture capital and the outside funding world, companies were funded out of retained earnings and bank borrowing. So it was a very disciplined, methodical uh, method to do that. The other thing that's happening is there are non-dilutive sources of capital, certainly in the U.S. government funding. And I think there's, there's lots of avenues to raise capital that uh, it doesn't come with dilution. Um, I think the good news is, is the tech business, and I use tech as a, sort of the corollary for what m most of your businesses are. Um, uh, there's an opportunity, there's been an ecosystem that's been developed, so you don't have to, you don't have to, it's not like the old days where you have to build everything. I think you can utilize uh, a leveraged network. Uh, there are non-direct channels of distribution, uh, there are plenty of opportunities to have partnerships with larger companies. You can outsource portions of your supply chain and other non-critical functions. And, and you don't need to build everything. Again, today, if we're doing something that needs Wi-Fi technology, we'd be crazy to go out and develop it. You can license that. Um, I think it's also helpful. What we learned, if we learned anything as students of business in 2008 and 2009, that cash flow was pr a pretty important uh, tenant for businesses. So I say drive to profitability as soon as possible. That doesn't mean be profitable at all costs, but a business model that's predicated upon raising hundreds of millions of dollars and we're going to keep pushing out profitability, I would suggest to you has an Achilles heel. So I think there should be a point in time where a business can try and become self-funding because then that eliminates the pressure for outside capital. And as we've learned, as due to the cycles of the market, and, and oh, by the way, my own personal bet, 
is the rising tide's over and you're going to be in for five years of flattishness. Uh, so you shouldn't count. There are going to be periods of time when capital is unavailable, and that's, that's a dangerous place to be if you need money. Um, I think the other challenge that people need, this is a different ball game than it was uh, a while ago, and that this is no longer every market we go after is a green field that grows 30%. It's more challenging because the industry is mature. There are pockets. So I think you need a board that has different makeups. I think we've been a little too insular as a community in terms of how we've populated our boards. And so I think boards that can help you grow your business, prepare for M&A, do other things, I think is really important. So I'd suggest that's another uh, way to build a lot of value as a private company. And, and then the other thing that's happened in the funding world, um, and this is more applicable to U.S. companies that need to raise larger amounts of capital, is that there's a lot of different pools of capital out there. It's no longer in the U.S. that you just walk up and down Sand Hill Road for capital. There are strategic investors. Uh, clean tech is an area that Israel is uh, dabbling into. Those are meaningful investors in a number of companies. There's sovereign wealth funds and quasi-government funding in a number of other regions. So there's a lot of different sources of capital. It's, it's a very different private capital market for those companies that need to raise later rounds of capital. So can this new model work? Again, I picked on two companies that I had worked on. The first was Galileo Technology. Uh, Galileo had raised three rounds of venture money. Um, they were doing Ethernet controller chips. Uh, they raised a total of $8 million. They got profitable in four years. Um, we took the company public in 1997 at $50 million, um, uh, $53 million. I think the market capitalization at the time was 300. And in 2000, it sold to Marvell for $2.7 billion. So, you, you know, that was an example where the company didn't need a ton of money to get to where it needed to be, and it generated, obviously, very attractive returns for shareholders. Um, the other one was another company I was more recently involved in was Passive. Um, Passive was a, a company where I was going to take it public and then turned up and went on the acquirer side and helped the company get bought. But Passive had raised two rounds of venture money. They'd taken in $7.1 million. They got profitable in a relatively quick time frame. Um, they were running it, I think it was actually greater than $40 million at the IPO, and they sold the company uh, for $300 plus million. And so that was a, a very attractive exit. So contrary to it does, the perception that it does take a little longer, this can be done. So it, 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 you don't always have to raise a ton of money to build successful companies and have successful returns. So what do we look for in a potential client um, I mean, there's a whole variety of things, of course. Um, one of those uh, certainly is the management and the backers behind the company. But I think today the public markets are a little more skeptical of companies that have a promise. So we're going to look at commercial traction, i.e. revenues, you know, momentum, and so on. I, I think you have to have a distinct competitive advantage. I really don't think for small companies to have sort of a me-too product that's really going to work. I think people want to see a large market opportunity that can grow for multiple years. Um, again, on, on the management, the board, the investors, a proven track record is very helpful. Um, one thing is really important that I'm very sensitive to, having sat, through, sat across the table so many times, is just the ability to make forecasts. Look, the one thing I'll say as a private company, I think the statistics are about 99.9% .9 of the time you won't make your forecast. That's, it's just the nature. It takes longer, markets, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's okay. That's normal. But when you get to that point where you're starting to talk to bankers, you need to really, an analyst, you need to take it very seriously about making your forecasts when you give them to people in that one-year window when you're getting ready to go public. Because we're looking at that and saying, do we have confidence in these people as a public company that can make their forecasts? And I can tell you, and, and I know you've heard it a thousand times too, people can always rationalize after the fact why it didn't happen. But the point is, is if you're a public company and you miss by 10, 20, 30, 40 percent, your stock gets cut in half. And that's not, a, that's not something that makes us very happy or the investors very happy. So I, I would encourage people to treat that very seriously. Monday morning rationalization does not inspire confidence. Um, and then one of the keys, and I think this is a good fact pattern for Israel, which is as the, as the technology infrastructure is developed and we have second generation entrepreneurs and experienced venture capitalists, there is more talent available at the management team leadership. So 
one of the keys in, you know, should you take it public, should you do an M&A, is do you have a team in place that can take a business to 300 million in sales? So what should you look for in a banker? I think the key is, is can they add value and are they good at working with small companies, emerging companies? Um, is that something that's important to them or is that something that's not a core business? The challenge in my business is, is that our, our, our business models change. A lot of the firms have gotten very big, and it's really hard to argue that, that emerging growth companies really matter. Um, and then the key is, and this is something that I think a lot of people really forget, it, so if you choose to go public, and we'd organize this talk really to be or, or, oriented around an IPO versus M&A, but if you choose to go public, you have to remember, again, that one inning of a nine-inning baseball game. Your wealth is realized as a management team or as venture capitals in the aftermarket. And so you need to make sure that you've got someone that you're not a forgotten story. And that's kind of what's happening. Not only do we get some of these companies public, but there's really not research written on the companies to convince the investors of what's going on. So you should look and say... Can your banker, can they help you with M&A? Do they know your sector? Do they know the other companies? Can they be thoughtful about what would be additive to your company? Do they have a sales force that's going to help you get out and tell your story? Do they have a research analyst that's committed to writing research more so than what we read today, which I really think the research on Wall Street in many cases is rather abysmal. It's just basically what you read are regurgitation of quarterly earnings reports, which I would submit to you has about this much value. And will they be willing to make a market in your stock to encourage investors to take a position because there's a liquid market? And, and then the key is, most importantly, are, are you going to be an important client? Are you going to be somebody that gets the attention of the firm or are you going to be just somebody that's on a deal list somewhere and they're off to the next? So um, I don't know how long that took, but that's my talk. Um, I just wanted to make sure I heard you correctly. You said go for a banker who has committed research behind him? No, <laughs> okay, just... Uh... Okay, um, my mother-in-law always used to tell me that you need to, be, you need to have three people in life to be happy. One, you have to have a good uh, butcher. Two, you have to have a good hairdresser. And three, you have to have a good uh, lawyer or a doctor. I'm not sure. Anyway, we already had today uh, a good lawyer, a good banker. What do we need now? A butcher, a good accountant. Where is the accountant? Come on. <laughs> Yaron, please. <laughs> 